This is Discern Realities, a Dungeon World podcast. My name is David. And my name is Jason. Awesome. Well, let's jump right into the first segment. Our first segment is What Happened Here Recently. Uh, Jason, I've got something I'd like to talk about uh, that happened here recently. Go for it. So recently, um, I've been thinking about how how GMs go about setting up and creating the world that their Dungeon World characters are playing in. You know, a lot of times GMs will use their own ideas if they think that they're very clever and they might have, you know, a novel in mind or a movie in mind that they try and imitate. Uh, sometimes those aren't the best adventures. <laughs> um, no, not uh, not often. Um, <laughs> uh, it can... I, I, I tend to try to uh, avoid games where I am just being... Um, like spoon fed the story and kind of watching passively as the GM does it all. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I love when the uh, GM is telling me exactly what my player is thinking or doing. <laughs> and, uh, my favorite thing in those games is when the GM has like a Gandalf character that the party is just following around. Oh know, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, those are the best. It can be, a, it can be a little bit much on that kind of railroad, but uh, so that's one way that some GMs will create worlds. Another is through supplemental texts, like we've been doing in our What Should I Be on the Lookout For section of the show. And a lot of times that's that's pretty good. I definitely would recommend that, uh, you know, because those are people who are being paid for, for their, you know, way of making a world. So it's probably, you know, pretty good. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of value in, like, you know, kind of incorporating ideas from other like people's adventures and stuff to into your own world you know like finding the good stuff is you know there's nothing wrong with that yeah absolutely here's what i really want to talk about this way of creating the player character's world um is by getting the players involved in that creation process and a really great way to do that is through a game a different game called microscope yeah do you want to set up what microscope is yeah so microscope is a story game that basically is about creating a timeline. At the end of the game, you're going to have this physical document that you created that's a bunch of note cards that you keep them in the right order, and and it's like a timeline. Um, It's got bigger areas of time and history, you know, kind of like an an epic or something, and then falling underneath that is a more narrow or focused... moment or conflict that happened and then even more narrowly focused than that is like a specific scene that's happening in that conflict yeah i think they're called uh periods events and then scenes so periods are like the big swathe of time and then events are important things that happened within that period and then uh scenes within the event Yeah. yeah exactly uh and so the way that i've used this um is i'll get my players together before we start a campaign and we'll play one of these games to kind of paint paint the picture of what the world that we're going to be in is like and some major events that have happened. And the players really get into it and they really love it. Um, There's a great thing at the beginning of the game too that is called the palette. And this is when you decide, hey, this is going to be in the game or no, this definitely won't be in the game. So if you've got someone, say, who doesn't want elves in the game, they can say during the palette, I don't want elves in this universe, and no one can really contest that. Right, right. Yeah, it's good. Um, I mean, I think one of the great advantages of using Microscope is it, it kind of helps create some investment in the world with the players, right? You know, I think, you know, at the outset, you were talking about, like, GMs just kind of creating their own world and kind of holding players' hands through it. And I find, honestly... Well, just from my own personal experience, I don't really like that. Like, I don't feel invested in the world at all. Like, I just feel like I'm a part of the GM story and and that he's already kind of come up with and like I had no input in it. But um, I've done this microscope thing, too. And that feels more like I feel like more attached to it, you know, because I was I helped kind of set it up. And I and I was I was like, you know, I was a person who introduced certain big like world you know, events and elements. And so I kind of had like a little bit of attachment to it. Um, Yeah, it's cool. It's really, really neat. I mean, have you, have you been having luck with it? I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, it's been going great. Uh, My player characters who were in on that initial microscope uh, session are always super excited to see the characters that we created or moments that we created happening in the background or in the distance or, you know, right in the middle of what's going on with them. And, you know, they get a little twinkle in their eye. And other players who weren't necessarily there for that are don't know what's going on, but they think it's really cool because it was a collaborative effort on 
several people's parts to get those ideas together. And that's always just better than one person's idea of a story. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And if you make the documents and stuff available, like, say, online or something, so, so that people can kind of see what's going on, that's all That's all the better, right? I, I find that um, my favorite part of setting up a world this way, and I did this, my, uh, I, I did Microscope to set up um, not just a Dungeon World game, it was a it was a year's worth of games. Uh, uh, it was a fantasy gaming year, but in different systems. So we played like different fantasy games, including Dungeon World. And um, one of the things that was really great, and you kind of mentioned it here a second ago, is the callbacks and the references to things that we've been made aware of, both through the timeline and other games, right? So um, that's it's a, it's a cool thing. Um, just to kind of piggyback on uh, when we talked about Grimworld, I guess, what was it, last week we talked about Grimworld? Yeah. Um. In in our microscope timeline, we had like the very very last thing that happened in the timeline was basically this like cataclysmic event that like destroyed most of civilization, and we explored that part of the timeline in Grimworld, right? Like that was the perfect opportunity to use Grimworld. So, oh yeah, uh, just a little yeah, a little little thing that we did that was that worked pretty well. But yeah, I think microscope is awesome. I think players should definitely check it out. I think the PDF's like ten bucks or something. I mean, yeah, it's very reasonable. Well, let's move on to the next segment. <laughs> Our next segment is what should I be on the lookout for? Jason, what should we be on the lookout for this week? So some of the very first fan published content for Dungeon World were these um, these series of supplements called the Take On Supplements by a company named Take On Games. I actually don't know the individual behind Take On Games. But um, anyway, there are several different ones. The first one was like take on magic items. Then there was take on more magic items. There was take on the lower depths, take on dragons. And what they are is they're just um, things you can use in your game, like custom moves and magic items you can use in your game and monsters. Um, and a little bit different from what we've been kind of talking about in this segment in prior weeks, these don't have any like adventure hooks or anything kind of connecting them. You know, they're just kind of random uh items and, and moves and monsters that you can just airdrop into your own campaign as needed. And um, I use them a lot. I, there are, um, I don't love all the stuff in each one, but, uh, but there's always like a lot of enough good stuff to make them worth picking up and, uh, and, and, and using them. The one I want to talk about specifically is called take on establishments. And I like that one, especially because what it is, it's just a series of like buildings and uh, businesses and locations in a city, right? Because I find that doing um, urban adventures and city-based adventure can be a little tough um, because it requires, like, uh, a little more planning, maybe, than just, like, you know, the characters roaming around in, in the wilds fighting monsters, you know? Because you have to, like, have thought of more NPCs. You have to thought of, like, locations. You have to thought of... You have, you have to have given some thought to real specific things. And you have to have named those things. And so... Um, take on establishments is pretty awesome. Uh, I will call out um, one establishment that is pretty awesome that I think is representative of the whole. It's called the Butchered Bound Pig. It's an inn. And one of the things you can do with the Butchered Bound Pig is the um, the innkeep can ask you or give you a job, uh, offer you a job to go shovel swine scat for the afternoon. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so, so there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a custom move called when you shovel swine scat for the afternoon, roll plus con. Um, I like that touch too, just making it a con roll. Um, on a 10 plus, you pick two from the list. On a 7 to 9, you pick one. And the options are you find evidence of a crime. The GM will tell you what. You overhear something scandalous. The GM will tell you what. You manage to avoid falling in the swine scat and ruining your clothes. So um, <laughs> I, 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 I kind of like that. I just think it's kind of, uh, I don't know. It's the sort of thing where, you know, like that could lead to more adventure, right? Like you could be having the, the characters be doing this like mundane thing, you know, and you could kind of have some fun with it, you know, um, you know, the way you, the way everyone, you know, kind of role plays it or whatever. Um, but then like you do this move and it can like lead to lead to things. It could lead to more adventure. Yeah. So I think it's pretty cool. Oh man. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. I mean, and it's such a nice, like way to draw the characters into the world to make it more immersive, you know, Obviously, there's going to be buildings and things like that, but when you start naming them and letting custom moves happen in those, it just brings it, it brings it alive, right? It just kind yeah. of brings it alive a little bit, and you don't have to like go to. And what I like about this is you don't 
have to like map out every goddamn thing in the city, right? Like you can just have this set of stu- of the of buildings and locations from take on establishments and kind of drop them in as as needed, like depending on what it seems like the players want to do, you know. And um, and you come across looking like a genius, right? Like you've you know so yeah, that's that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, and that's just like we were talking about with the world building. When you're using other people's ideas, you just you just seem so much more clever as a GM than if you're just trying to come up with it all yourself. Yeah, yeah. There's a mix, right? There's a mix of like. You know, I think I think you find like a good mix of like stuff I'm using from supplements. You know, uh, some of my big picture world ideas I've I've kind of come up with, or you know, my adventure fronts and that sort of thing. But then also like player input, like that combination of all three is really like the sweet spot, right? Of like of prep, right? Yeah, like being able to incorporate all three of those things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, the original take on magic items a little bit. I just picked it up um, last night and. I was reading through it, and I agree with you 100% that it can be a little bit of a mixed bag as far as how good the items are. But, you know, I think if I use some of these items that I don't necessarily like a whole bunch, I might be surprised by the results I get out of the players when they when they see it and, and think something different than I do about it. That's the thing, you know? Like, I will put a thing in a game that's that's that maybe I've just gotten off a random like treasure generator or something, you know, like just some random piece of equipment or jewelry that I have no real thoughts about what it might be used for. Um, but there's always some player at the table who like takes that and finds something to do with it, you know? So even those items that, you know, on take on magic items that you might think are a little, eh, I'm not sure what to do with that. Uh, you're right. Your players will. Yeah. Uh, but I, I want to highlight one uh, out of here as well. A little freebie for the players. We'll keep with the uh, we'll keep with the nasty pig um, motif we've got going. Um, this is the porcelain pig of prosperity. So this poorly painted porcelain pig figurine appears That's to a great the, alliteration, yeah. by the way. This poorly painted pig <laughs> figurine. Uh, this poorly painted porcelain pig figurine appears to be the work of an artistically disinclined student. When you place a single coin in the pig's small slotted mouth and leave it there until the next sunrise. Two coins, exactly like the original, can be found in the pig's slotted rump. <laughs> okay, nice. I like that. It's good. Uh, yeah. The coin in the pig's mouth is gone. When you gently polish the pig and gleefully mutter the phrase, Give me, give me, pork, pork, now, 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 the porcelain pig grows and permanently transforms into a succulent, aromatic, roasted hog large enough to feed 30 people. <laughs> nice nice it's good <laughs> and then uh inside the roasted hogs intestine can always be found a new porcelain pig of prosperity nice <laughs> it's good so men have um, went mad uh, searching for enchanted coins to feed to their pig but the wise realize that this can't possibly work can it <laughs> it's good um actually it just occurred to me that i uh, one of my players has this item right now in one of the games I'm running. Oh, really? And they, and they don't know the full story behind it, so I hope they don't listen to this. <laughs> or I hope they do listen to it, but I know they, they better play their character like they don't have that information, right, until they... You know, yeah, so. if they just bust out uh, doing the, the new stuff. The, the, then, little, the little poem thing, yeah. Yeah, then, then you're going to have to be like, hmm, you're going to have to tell me, you know, how your character found out about that. Yeah. So anyway, these um, these take on supplements. I have them all, and there's good stuff in all of them. I mean, you, there's stuff you can find and uh, you know build whole adventures out of if you want, or just kind of make them just random little bits that your characters encounter and run into. Um, it's it's good stuff. Definitely go pick those up, and they're dirt cheap. Yeah. Uh, this one was just uh, donate to get. So yeah, pay what you want or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely, you can feel free to give as much or as little as you feel this is worth, and uh, and use it to great effect. I'm always needing little odds and ends to drop in because I can't come up with great just loot on the fly beyond coins and gems and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, let's move on to the next segment. Our next segment is what here is not what it appears to be. Jason, I understand that you think that undertaking a perilous journey is not exactly what it appears to be. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, I think it's I think it's exactly what it appears to be, but I do want to talk about how you might be able to take the undertake a perilous journey move and make it a little more interesting. Okay, great. So Undertake a Perilous Journey is an abstraction of the classic adventuring party moving over the, you know, the moving over wild terrain, right, uh, to get to the dungeon, right? That's a, that's a thing that we, um, that is a very tropey sort of thing in the adventure games. I think, um, 
a lot of older role playing games concern themselves with with like the real granular details of that journey. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, they get to be really simulationist about it. Yeah, yeah, like there's lots of like, oh, how how many days journeys are going to be, and like, you know, what what's our what's our movement rate if we're on horses? What's our movement rate if we're on foot? You know, all that kind of thing, right? Um, undertake a perilous journey, kind of, you know, through these three different roles that get made. Um, basically kind of summarizes the, the perilous journey, right? Abstracts it. Um, but the thing is, is I've heard a lot of people complain about how it feels a little simple and a little unsatisfying. And I have lately, like in the last six months or so, I have incorporated this new procedure for Undertake a Perilous Journey that I think people will like. Now, before I get going, I'll say that um, Jason Lutz has published this thing called uh, Perilous Wilds or something like that. Um, I'm not super familiar with it, but I've, I gather that it's like a... Um, it's kind of like a way of it's a, it's a more comprehensive way of making that overland journey like more interesting. Oh, okay, so, yeah, I actually I actually got that one in a bundle recently, and I've been meaning to look look at it, but I haven't got a yeah, chance. Yeah, yeah, his, his his stuff is really awesome. I, I can't wait to check that one out. But but in the meantime, I do think that uh, my little procedure here for undertake a perilous journey is really a really really solid way of still abstracting the journey but making it feel um meaningful. Okay, so here's what I've got. So in the move, you have to have a trailblazer, a scout, and a quartermaster, right? Um, now, if you have at least three characters, you're going to have all three roles. If not, you have to, you have to, you know, you have to take one of the roles as if they failed. But um, I always have four or five players, so the three roles will get filled. Um, the trailblazer, you, the trailblazer role determines like if you make the journey in a reasonable amount of time, right? But what I do is before the trailblazer rolls, I ask the player to describe a couple of things about the geography. And then I ask them, tell me a landmark that you're looking out for that's going to help guide your way, right? So the player thinks about it for a second. And let's say they say, oh, there's, um, there's like a, there's like a battlefield nearby. Like like the, the trees are all scorched and burned and stuff because there was a great battle. And so I might follow up with, well, what was the battle about? Like, can you tell me like a little bit of history about what, you know, who, who fought there? Um, that sort of thing, right? Like it's a way of, developing the fiction that external fiction that i always talk about it's a way of developing the fiction of the land right and so it kind of makes that um the geography part of it like seem uh more substantial right so that's the trailblazer for the scout who is ahead of the group um, scouting ahead for danger i always ask the scout player now i say what kinds of dangers do you expect to run into Right. <laughs> like what a, what sorts of monsters or enemies or rumors have you heard about, you know, what what's in this land? Like, what do you need to keep your eyes open for? And that's the answer is great, because whatever they answer, they're kind of doing my job for me in terms <laughs> of like if the, if the role goes poorly and they have to encounter something on poor terms or if they just have to encounter something, period like the they've kind of like fed me the information. Right. I usually tweak it a little bit to make it, you know, kind of fit, um, you know, the kind of like the circumstances or to um, or to make it like a little more surprising. But uh, but I always like I, I like hearing that. And, and I and, and every now and then you get a player who like um, cause I'll ask the question, right? And then I'll kind of move on and ask other people questions before I let them do the role. And then I'll go back to the scout, uh, and, and have them do the role and then discuss what's going on. And then when they run into the thing that they, that they thought they were going to run into, like for just a brief moment, uh, often players for just a brief moment will like say, Oh, I knew it, you know, or like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, 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 like they had a flash of brilliant insight. It only takes them, it only takes a second before they're, before they realize like, Oh yeah, I told you that. But, um, <laughs> but, but it's fun though. Yeah. It's good fun. Um, and then, uh, for the quartermaster who is responsible for maintaining supplies in the group, I always ask the quartermaster player, um, party dynamic questions, right? Like the sort of, um, the sort of like mundane things that are easy to forget about or even gloss over or that, you know, you would normally gloss over. So I might ask, um, what annoying habits does the halfling have? Right. Um, tell me about the song that the elf sings. Like, how does it make you feel? That sort of thing, right? <laughs> I I ask questions that kind of like explore the party dynamics a little bit. And then, and I do appropriate follow-up questions with, with characters as needed. Um, and then for any character who's not a part of the, um, the Undertake a Perilous Journey move, I ask them questions about the destination, okay? So I might say, well, this destination, let's say this castle, this castle is really important to your family for some reason. Why? Or you hope to, ex you expect to find like this certain item 
in the castle? What is it, right? Uh, what dangers have you heard about in the castle? That sort of thing, right? I ask them questions about the destination. So everyone gets a chance to kind of participate in the journey, and everyone is also creating more of that external fiction, right? Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. That's uh, that's such a good way to kind of make the sometimes tedious task of the perilous journey a lot more enriching and to draw your players into helping create the world some more and to kind of flesh out their characters a bit more. That's that's really great. Yeah, it makes it meaningful. It's pretty it's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I I do something a little bit similar whenever the whenever my players carouse where I, you know, ask them how they're partying and they always have a good time with that. But this is really really great. All right, well, let's move on to the next segment. Our next segment is what here is useful or valuable to me? Jason, uh, I understand you've got something for us today. Yeah, so uh, lately, well, not lately, but recently I've developed this custom move. And I don't actually know if it works yet. Um, Hopefully, maybe some players will try it out or some other or some listeners rather will try it out and give me some feedback on uh, how it went. <laughs> but, um, but I, but I did this thing that I think is, uh, I like it and I'm, I'm anxious to see how it, how it works out. But the idea is you give the player characters a chance to, to glimpse visions of how they might die. Okay. So the way I introduced this move recently into my game was I had this character who was like a seer and she was looking at her, you know, in this like, uh, in this like divination device, like this crystal ball. And the way the move went was if you look into the crystal ball, you see several different visions of how you might die. You then gain three hold. You may spend the hold whenever you roll. Uh, explain how what is about to take place is connected with a vision of how you will die. Then mark one XP. If you subsequently fail the roll, you go straight to last breath. Yeah, that just clicked in my mind. And that's, that's pretty cool. So it's like, so it's like I just talked to the seer and I had my visions. I don't tell anyone right then what happened, but then later on, I've got to make this you know ridiculous leap. So I have to do a defy danger dex to jump across this chasm. And I say I want to use one I hold, um, and I had a vision of me like slipping down this chasm. And then I make my roll, and as long as I, you know, do all right, I get an XP and I lose one hold. And but I made the jump. Well, you get the XP no matter what, right? right? As long as you spend the hold, you get the XP. But the thing is, on the on the Defy Danger decks, if you get a six minus, um, the GM doesn't get to make a move as normal. The result is replaced by last breath. Yeah. Okay. okay. So it's like it's like confirming the vision, right? Yeah. So um, I think it's pretty cool. I mean, so the question and the reason why it may or may not work is the question is, well, would a player ever do this? You know, would they actually spend the hold for the XP gain? I mean, <laughs> I would as a player because I, I like to play dangerously. So I, I definitely would. But um, I think even like more cautious players might make a little risk, a little risk reward assessment. <laughs> like if they were going to do a, if they were, if they were, if they triggered a move that they get a good bonus on, you know, yeah. then they might, then they might like say, oh, okay, well, I've got like a plus two or a plus three. So this is really the chance to like, this is the time to spend this. Right. Um, and to, and to, and so then they give me a, you know, they give, they give us some narration about how this connects to a vision and then they, then they do the thing. I mean, um, I think it could be a fun risk reward type thing. I, I like moves that have that built in. So yeah, I definitely would use this as a player. Um, anytime I can get XP, I'm trying to, because I'm always looking ahead in my playbook and I've never maxed out a character and there's always sweet moves that I want to have. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, yeah, I think it could be fun. So I've, I've recently exposed, uh, a couple of the players to this. Uh, we had it come up in a game and, um, and anybody listening can just take this. It doesn't have to be like a seer looking into a crystal orb. It could be like, you know, a, a silver bowl filled with water that shows you visions of how you might die or, you know, a mirror that's in a mansion somewhere and shows you visions of how you might die. I mean, you can kind of adjust it, you know, you can adjust the fictional part of it as needed, but, um, but I, yeah, I, I, I'm very curious to see if it works. Yeah. I think that it will. I mean, yeah, that sounds pretty great. Uh, are you are you worried that like players might use it in really monotonous or tedious like circumstances and then accidentally die from it? Oh, I hope so. Oh, I totally hope so. <laughs> that would... Yeah, that's like that's like my greatest hope. I mean, <laughs> I hope that like they decide to spend this on something like, you know, um like bribing the guard at the jail or whatever, you know. <laughs> and the guard is just like you they roll a six and the guard just like shanks their ass, right? Like I would told like I would love that, right? Oh um, my god. I would hate that. Like you're I'm like, well, I'm about to I'm about to parlay this old woman at plus three, plus one, plus one 
for some reason I've got all these pluses. I might as well use it. And then it goes bad. Right. And yeah. I somehow <laughs> die from the old woman. <laughs> well, if you're rolling that many pluses, you wouldn't roll a six. You wouldn't get a six, right? But the, the move might need to be tweaked a little bit to where it can't be completely gamed, you know? Like if they, if they manage to get like somehow like as much as plus five or whatever. I don't even know if that's possible in Dungeon World. That might be against the rules. I'm not sure. But, um, I've never had that happen. Uh, yeah. I think it'll, I think it'll work as written, but, but yeah, I like that. All right. Cool. Anything else you want to say about it? No, no, it's all I got. All right. Well, let's move on to the next segment then. Our next segment is what is about to happen. All right. So this is our ongoing comic strip AP following the adventures of Ramshackle Crow. And when we last saw Ramshackle, he had found a secret passageway and was heading down some stairs uh, in the secret uh, sort of secret stairway in the temple, presumably going down to the vault that contains the gem he has come to steal from the temple of the peerless star. And we, I think we immediately left off, or I think we immediately pick up on you at the bottom of the stairs uh, facing an iron door that has been decorated in bas relief to be in the image of a five pointed star, which is the sacred symbol of this temple. Um, what do you do? Yeah, so I had just heard some some clinking and clanking on the other side of the door. So I'm imagining there's that's probably the vault. I don't know for sure, but you know it could be. So I gotta I gotta get to the other side of this door. But it really seems like the kind of door that would be trapped would have some kind of booby trap on it. So I gotta make sure that it's clear before I just you know turn the handle and let myself in. So I'm kind of getting on my hands and knees and looking into the lock and looking at the door from different angles to see if it shimmers from some kind of magical or if it's, you know, got a trip wire or pressure plate or anything like that that I can detect. Okay, um, go ahead and roll Trap Expert. All right, so I got a nine. Okay, um, on a nine, I believe you get to ask uh, one question, two questions? Just the one, I believe. Is there a trap here? And if so, what triggers it? There is a trap here. In fact, it is a uh, it's a pressure plate trap. You were correct to look for that. It's right at the. Um, it's very very small, and it would be right as you stepped into the room if you're not careful. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, that's that's what it is. Okay, all right. So <clears throat> I see that when I'm on my hands and knees, I can see it through the crack in the door. Um, I actually like have a little bit of powder that I like sprinkle on the ground and I blow it. And as it goes across, it kind of goes over the top of this pressure plate and really makes it obvious to me. So I know to look for that whenever I'm going through this door, I'm going to try it and see if it, if the door's locked, if it's not, you know, well, let's see if it's locked. Uh, the door is locked. Um, but if you can unlock it, um, in, in, in quick enough time, uh, you can, you can avoid like anybody like hearing you or, or possibly coming down the stairs. Right. And uh, and just step over that pressure plate. So. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's try and crack this door. Yeah. So you roll tricks of the trade for that. All right. And I got an eleven. Awesome. Yeah. Um, describe uh, get again easily. Yeah. So I know the pressure plate's there. I stand up and uh, and I and I kind of open my open my guard's uniforms jacket and reach inside and pull out my my nice little trusty set of tools. And just faster, faster than someone else could maybe you know snap three times. I've got that. I've got that lock open. No problem. The door's open too. It didn't even make a squeak because I actually oiled the hinges a little bit just to make sure. That's you know what any master would do. And then I just give a light step over top of that pressure plate, and I'm in the room. Awesome. When you get inside the room, you find yourself in. It's a circular room that has two corridors going, um, uh, connecting off of it. So, like, if you were to look, like, kind of top down at this at this room and the corridors, it would look kind of like an L, but with like, with like a little bulge at the at the corner. Um, so there's like a circle, and then there's like two corridors, one going off to the north and the other going off to the east. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. And there's also a door. Um, a simple wooden door set in the wall about, um, I don't know, about halfway across the, you know, the, the, the perimeter of this circular room, of, like from the door that you entered in. So, yeah. Okay. All right, then. Um, is, there's no one around. Are there like, 
torches lit or anything like that illuminating it? Or am I just seeing this by the light of my own torch? Uh, it's just the light of your own torch. Okay. In that case, I heard, just heard that one door open and close, I think, because that seems like the only thing in here that would be making noise. Uh, in fact, in fact, uh, you if you if you move your torch around, you'll see on the floor as well that there is a large circular metal grate on the floor. Okay, so it's about maybe um, the room itself is probably like uh, about maybe like thirty feet in diameter, something like that. And then this grate in the middle is about ten feet in diameter, like in the center. Okay, so it's like a metal grate that is set into the floor of the circular room. Oh, okay. So maybe that was what I heard. Hmm. I'm going to walk closer to that grate and see what I can see through it. Yeah, yeah. So you just like kind of flash your torchlight down there and check it out. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead and do discern realities. All right. So I got the middle results. So one question. Um, What should I be on the lookout for? As you're you're kind of like looking down with your torch and kind of, uh, you know, seeing what you can see, you actually... um, you actually see something uh, like, so the torchlight is like kind of shining down inside, but you see like um, kind of in the perimeter of the torchlight from where you can see it, you see something like kind of break the light a little bit as if it's like moving through the light, but just out of your, just out of the where you can see it though. Oh, so there's something down there. Yeah. Yeah. There's something there. It's, it, 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 it kind of like just kind of blocked the light a little bit as it passed through, but you couldn't quite get a good look. Okay. Did it, did it seem like it was like big or, couldn't really yeah it seemed pretty big yeah okay i don't i'm not in love with that let's um let's not go down the creepy hole instead let's um let's go check out that other door let's go see what that's about is it sure yeah it's, it's just a, a simple wooden door yeah okay all right just a real simple wooden door it's got a it's got a, a lock and a, and a little door and a door handle real just plain okay um well let's you know, let's see if this one's locked. I don't think this one's trapped. It doesn't look important enough to be trapped, but um, it is locked. But it's uh, but messing with the as you mess with the lock, nothing nothing happens. But yeah, it's definitely locked. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and try and pop that door open too. Then yeah, go ahead and roll. Oh no, I got a five. Okay, so as you are um, fiddling around with the uh, with with the lock, trying to like you know pop it open. Um, you hear, uh, you didn't you didn't hear the steps in time, but you hear you hear the metal door that you came in. You hear like a chunk chunk and like a <laughs> as the as the door is kind of sliding open. Um, someone's coming into the room, oh. and I think we should leave it right there. Okay, all right. All right, folks. Well, that's our show. That just means we have one final question: Who is really in control here, Jason? Who's really in control? So that would be the Gauntlet gaming community. Um, the Gauntlet can be located on G+, uh, by going to the community section of G+, and uh, searching for the Gauntlet. Um, it will pop right up. The Gauntlet also has um, a meetup where we organize online games. Uh, these games are played through, through Google Hangouts, but we organize them through meetup. You can find the link to the meetup um, in our community page. Uh, we are also on Twitter at Gauntlet RPG. And, uh, oh, one thing I want to mention is uh, we have another podcast which we've occasionally mentioned called the gauntlet podcast it's like our the the main podcast of our community um in episode 39 the one that was just released that one actually uh, contains a new a segment that we're trying out called game advocates in which we have someone on the show who has played a certain game a lot and they kind of advocate for that game and why it's so awesome and uh, I am the first game advocate, and so um, uh, advocating for Dungeon World. So if you're a list- if you enjoy this podcast, you will almost certainly enjoy listening to that episode as well. So you should go check that out. Uh, but yeah, that's all I've got. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jason. Yep. Thanks, listeners. That's our show. Mm-hmm.